even if I've never seen a case of this particular disease before, I know what to do because I'm not treating the disease, I'm treating the body, I'm treating the system, I'm creating health. The first question that we have from Gary in your community uh, who asks about Lewy body dementia, and we're gonna tee up mm. his video clip over here. My mother passed from Lewy body dementia, as did my comedy and adult childhood idol, Robin Williams, who was suffering when he passed. I'd like to know everything you know. Are there any successful treatments? Have people rebounded? Is there any potential cures? Well, Gary, thank you so much for that question. And um, sadly, I've had a lot of opportunity to treat Lewy body patients. But the good news is there's something you can do about it. Uh, and Lewy body, for those people who don't know what it is, is a form of dementia that's sort of a combo between Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. So it's like dementia with a lot of motor features. So it affects this part of the brain called the basal ganglia, which controls motor function, but also has far reaching effects throughout the brain. And you know, when we talk about dementia, there's no such thing as dementia. There are dementias uh, and they're all different and they have different causes. Even for example, Alzheimer's may have very different causes. Uh, and Dale Bredesen, we've had on the podcast, has talked a lot about the various causes, whether it's inflammatory triggers, mold, toxins, Lyme, blood sugar issues, insulin, the, nutritional deficiencies, hormonal dysregulation. There's all these things that drive brain dysfunction. And so there's dementia that's classified as Alzheimer's, dementia that's Lewy body, dementia that's we call vascular dementia from little mini strokes. At the end of the day, we have to think broadly about what the root causes are. So while on the pathology, it may look the same. In other words, when you take someone's brain, you cut it open after they die, and you look at it, you're gonna see the same pattern of cellular dysfunction and the same kinds of pathology on the slides amongst all the people with Lewy body or amongst all the people with Alzheimer's or amongst all the people with vascular dementia. But that doesn't mean the causes are the same. So, you know, while I've seen patients with Lewy body, they're different from each other. Uh, and, I, and I'm just recalling one in particular who was quite disabled, uh, who I got pretty late in the process. And when the functional medicine approach, uh, even if I've never seen a case of this particular disease before, I know what to do because I'm not treating the disease, I'm treating the body, I'm treating the system, I'm creating health, and I'm removing all the impediments to health and adding in all the ingredients for health. And when I do that, the body's innate healing system starts to act, it starts to repair and start to renew and heal. And it's actually shocking to me, you know, because I'm so brainwashed still by medical school, I'm so brainwashed to think that, oh, this is impossible. Even though I kind of know after 30 years of practicing functional medicine that it is, I'm still sort of shocked when I try this stuff and it actually works. <laughs> and I, I'll just sort of share a, a case of a patient that'll uh, sort of help you illustrate what we can do and what we did find and what actually matters. Uh, this patient was about 85 years old, uh, a woman who really was struggling. And when she was brought to me, she was unable to walk. She was in a wheelchair because of the motor dysfunction. She came to my office. We had to have three people pick her up. And she was a little lady. We had three people literally pick her up to stand on the scale to weigh her. And she was unable to run her business affairs. She had really a very large, successful business and was on the board and was heavily involved and was just no longer functioning. She couldn't go out anymore. She couldn't socialize anymore. She was really homebound and wheelchair ridden. Wheelchair, is that ridden? Ridden? Wheelchair bound. <laughs> wheelchair bound. And uh, she, she was um, referred to me by uh, a friend and, and her her son and, and her and I talked for a bit and she really had trouble speaking. Uh, she had trouble talking because of the motor effects. Uh, and, it, and I was like, well, gosh, I don't know if there's anything I can do, but let's take a look. So it turned out even though she was thin, uh, she was diabetic and her blood sugar was very poorly controlled because she ate a lot of carbohydrates. So she may not have been overweight, but she was over fat and under lean. In other words, she was what we call metabolically obese, normal weight. She was thin on the outside, but fat on the inside. And all the metabolic parameters around blood sugar were just way off. And she had a, um, also a lot of gut issues and had never really had normal bowel movements, was severely constipated, uses colonics and enemas and laxatives for years and years and years and years. And then she had all these weird other things. She had all these migratory rashes all over her body, which were yeast infections on her skin, on her breasts and, and, and everywhere. And, and she kept getting these shots from her doctor to for energy, which were steroid shots, which is, I think, criminal. Uh, yes, it's great to have if you're climbing Mount Everest and you're going to die, you take a steroid shot like Decadron, adrenaline shots, so you can get off the mountain. But it's not meant to be used for 
people who are just a little tired. It's, it's basically the stress hormone and it causes the brain to shrink. It causes diabetes. It causes all kinds of muscle wasting, hormonal dysregulation, low growth hormone. I mean, it's, it's just a disaster to be taking on a regular basis. So this was contributing to her problem. And she also was really significantly nutritionally deficient in many, many nutrients, including B12, folate, B6. Uh, so she had, she had tremendous gut issues. She had diabetes and she had significant nutritional deficiencies and hormonal dysfunction. Uh, and so I, I kind of looked at the whole picture and I said, well, let's just start to rebuild your system from the ground up. So the first thing we did was clean up her gut. And, uh, and she turned out she had tremendous amounts of yeast from all the steroids and antibiotics she'd been on. Uh, she was severely constipated, which can go along with yeast overgrowth or what we call CFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, uh, which is similar to SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. She was bloated, distended, uncomfortable. And so we got her gut normalized. I gave her an antifungal, I gave her probiotics, I gave her a whole gut repair program, gave her magnesium, I took away all the laxatives and got her on uh, MCT oil, vitamin C, magnesium, which really helped bowel movements. And so she started normalizing her gut, which is great. And, and then we, we actually also addressed the blood sugar. So we put her on a modified ketogenic diet, extremely low carbohydrate, higher in fats, and the brain loves this. And particularly in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, there's really good data showing that a ketogenic diet can be really helpful symptomatically. And I've had many other patients with Alzheimer's, when they get pretty bad, I'll often try a ketogenic diet when, when I see them slipping. And it's, it's remarkable. It's like the light bulb goes on in their brain because the brain works much better on fat than sugar, which kind of contradicts everything I learned in medical school, which is that your brain takes up 25% of your energy requirements as glucose, sugar. So you need sugar for your brain actually sugar is poison for your brain. Yes, you need energy for your brain, uh, but that energy can be obtained through a very low glycemic diets and particularly through ketones, which are much more efficient and cleaner burning fuel that, than sugar and can be derived from things like MCT oil, which is a great source of, of uh, fat that actually turns into ketones in the body and helps mitochondrial function. The other part of dementia, Parkinson's in particular, and Lewy body, is that it's a mitochondrial problem, which is an energy problem. So there's an energy deficit inside the cells, which makes it difficult to move and think and do all the things we want to do. So I basically cleaned up her gut. I got her diet sorted to be extremely low glycemic, full of phytochemicals, super high in fat, very low sugar, starch, and, and her blood sugar normalized, her gut normalized. And then I started upregulating some of these B vitamin pathways that have to do with brain chemistry that can be contributing to dementia, like B12 deficiency. She was on acid blockers, all kinds of drugs I had to take her off of. It was, these people are in polypharmacy. I once visited a patient at home, it was a mother of a, of a friend, another patient, and she was on 22 different prescription drugs, which is terrifying. And all the drug interactions and all the side effects. And I mean, it, I don't even know how that happens. It's like you see one doctor, they give you a drug, you see another doctor, they give you a drug, and nobody's talking to anybody else. It's, it's kind of the failure of modern medicine. And so, I, I clean up her gut, I got her blood sugar under control, I optimize her pathways around methylation, B vitamin status, and I, I also gave her, gave her some hormonal support. Her thyroid was off, her sex hormones were low. So I basically just kind of tuned her up. I just optimized her systems from a functional medicine perspective. And I didn't know what would happen. I thought, oh, well, hopefully she'll feel better, at least she'll be going to the bathroom and her blood sugar is controlled. But it was a miracle, literally a miracle, Drew. I, 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 <laughs> I went to visit her at her apartment in New York I made a house call and I was shocked. She, she literally got up out of her wheelchair and she walked down the hall unassisted. And I was like, holy cow, her verbal wow. fluency increased. She was able to get back and do her business. She recorded another album. She wrote a book. <laughs> it was like, what happened to her? And I, 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 I really, uh, I really learned so much from this case because just by applying these foundational principles about restoring health in the gut, in hormones in blood sugar, in mitochondria and also optimizing these pathways around biochemistry that are so important for brain function that have to do with methylation and sulfation detoxification she really improves so dramatically and you know i wouldn't have thought this was possible but the the, the good thing about her was that she had a team so she had a full-time nurse 24 7. she had somebody cooking for her she could afford what i was asking her to do and had the the setup to do it at home and by simply following the principles, and by the way, like, you know, Benjamin Franklin said it very well, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So, you know, an ounce of prevention is early on, you don't have to do much to stay healthy, but if you're really, really sick, you need a pound of cure. 
And so she was kind of needing the pound of cure. So it was a very intensive program, but she did it. And the results were really remarkable. And I think that, you know, people out there listening need to be aware that, that while, while you were seeing rising case of dementia and Parkinson's and Lewy body, and, and it seems hopeless right now because traditional medicine has just failed at this. There's been, I think, over $2 billion of studies, over 400 clinical trials uh, studying all sorts of drug interventions, and every single one of them has failed. Even the new drug that, quote, got approved is a joke. It's super expensive. It doesn't really have make that much difference. It's like incremental, right? So, oh, I'm going to keep you out of the nursing home an extra three months. That's a blockbuster drug. No, it's terrible. It's like, that's not a metric. So the metric is, can you get back to life? Can you do the things you like to do? Can you socialize? Can you, you know, walk? Can you talk? Can you think? Can you be engaged in your life in a meaningful way? And that's the result she got. And I, and I, I think, you know, people listening might think, oh God, that's crazy, Dr. Hyman. That can't be true. That's just an anecdote. Where's the science? Where's the proof? Blah, blah, blah. And, and I, I would just say to you, you know, if there's one case like this, then doesn't that merit a lot of investigation? We should be literally pouring billions of dollars of federal money into these kinds of research projects. And yet it doesn't get funded because like, oh, we have to study everything separately. Uh, well, well, let's just study blood sugar. Okay, let's just treat mitochondria. No, no, let's just treat the gut. No, let's just give them B vitamins. No, let's just do this one thing. And I'm like, no, the body is a system. If you want to grow a plant, you know, well, I'm just going to give it sunlight, but no soil or water. Or I'm just going to give it <laughs> soil, but no water or sunlight. I'm like, no, <laughs> you, need, you need all the things that are required for health. It's like, well, let's just see what works. Um, water is good for you, so we're just going to have you drink water for a year and see what happens. Well, you'll die. <laughs> you know, like, okay, we're just going to, Eating is good, vegetables are good for you. So all you're gonna do is eat vegetables, but you can't drink water. Well, you're gonna die. So like, we have to understand that the body is an ecosystem and that's what functional medicine is all about. It's about helping restore the ecosystem of the body to a more balanced state and optimizing the functional systems that determine our health. So if you're out there and you have dementia or you have someone with dementia in your family or Lewy body or Parkinson's, it, 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 it's a lot of work but it can be dealt with more effectively. And I and it's one of the most satisfying parts of my practice because people get their life back. So many layers there, Mark. I have a thousand follow-up <laughs> questions for you. Let's okay, go. get right into it. So number one, thank you for sharing that story. I hadn't heard that one. And uh, that was a really beautiful and touching story. So a few themes that I want to get a chance to pull back from. Number one, you mentioned Dale Bredesen. He's been on your podcast before. Mm. You've had many conversations with him. Mm. He has a network called Recode, I believe, where he has yes. a whole list of practitioners all around the country that are trained in his protocol. Is that yep. one step? If somebody is in this position or has been diagnosed early, should they consider you know, going to them? Obviously, we don't have any formal affiliation besides being a fan, right? Just want to make that yeah, clear for yeah. everybody. But is yeah. that one step to go find the right practitioner? For sure, for sure. So Dale is an amazing guy. He's a, he's a research uh, neurologist. So he's a neuroscientist who worked at the Buck Institute on Aging and was an academic scientist. And his wife was doctor as well, but she was a functional medicine doctor and she was always pushing him a little bit. And, and I think my, my book, Ultra Mind Solution came out in 2009 and he read the book and he, through reading the book, realized that the things that I was observing clinically and the results I was getting clinically were the things that he was seeing in the laboratory on the bench that hadn't quite reached clinical practice yet but actually it had through functional medicine. And that led him down this path of rethinking everything he's doing and looking as a neurologist, as an Alzheimer's expert, as a dementia expert, looking at these principles and starting to apply them. And so he started to apply them in a kind of a loose way and he started seeing these results. And after patient after patient, he got very serious about it. And, and he's really taken this work and created not just the books he's written, uh, including the last one, I think the first survivors. I think there's like, I mean, people the first know there's survivors breast of Alzheimer's, cancer. Yeah. Right, that's first, first, there's survivors of cancer, there's survivors of heart attacks, but who's a survivor of Alzheimer's? So, well, there are survivors now. And I've had many of them in my I practice. So he basically took that science and combined it with the principles of functional medicine and created a scalable model online and in person to find out what's going on with you. And it's called Recode. So. Uh, you know, we might have a few differences around the edges here and there, but we're like 98% aligned. And I think he's done a great job of making this uh, widespread and accessible. And and to, to to just hear him talk and hear him share the stories. And actually, there's a documentary that they 
were making years ago. I saw it. I don't know what happened to it, but it really was about all these Alzheimer's survivors and dementia survivors. And it's like, okay, well, if that's true, then, um, you know, why, why aren't we actually doing this at scale? And it's just like everything else. I mean, we know the cure for diabetes is better food. Uh, and that's not a controversial idea. And yet insurance doesn't pay for it. Doctors don't know what to do with the information and they just keep prescribing drugs. So, you know, we're in the same situation with, with pretty much everything else that works in medicine that isn't mainstream. It's, it's just marginalized because of perverse financial incentives, because you know, doctors don't understand it, because the research infrastructure doesn't fund the kinds of research that shows uh, how systems approaches work. They're very much reductionist. So let's look at this one drug for this one pathway for this one disease and see if it works when we keep everything else normal. But that's just not how our bodies work. That's a big part of this podcast and the work that you do, even separate from, you know, you have a nonprofit that does advocacy work and trying to lobby Congress, Food Fix, foodfix.org, if people want to check it out. But I would say that this podcast that you've created is also advocacy work because how change happens in society is by the spread of ideas. So somebody who's a research assistant somewhere and part of a grant application team Here's a podcast because their sister or mother is suffering from something. And all of a sudden, it puts a little seed in their head that there's a different approach. They get excited. They talk to their, you know, uh, manager, at, you know, at their research clinic or university. They start to say, maybe there's something that's there. And that's how momentum gets started. Or a doctor's listening here and they're treating a high profile patient. That patient decides to start talking about your work or how they've been influenced by the principles of functional medicine. And momentum builds momentum. So a big part of this is just spreading enough education so people get excited enough to want to look. Because if you try to go direct to the source and convince people, it goes back to that standard Max Planck yeah. quote that people yeah. know so well. <laughs> you know, changes in medicine happen one funeral at a time. Well, well I think well, he said actually, science, but changes in yeah, science yeah. and medicine happen one funeral at a time. Yeah. He said, basically, the quote is, uh, you know, science doesn't advance by convincing your opponents and helping them see the light, but because they eventually die and a new generation grows up that's familiar with it. That's actually the quote. But it's exactly, basically one funeral exactly. at a time. <laughs> yeah, one funeral at a time. And uh, it was funny because, you know, I know you're studying longevity. Uh, Elon Musk was interviewed uh, a couple of weeks ago and he was like, the, the person um, was asking him, you know, all your friends uh, or your contemporaries, Jeff mm. Bezos and this person, all the yeah. billionaires are exploring yeah. longevity and longevity, they're putting hundreds yeah, yeah. of millions of dollars in the yeah. space. Yeah. Why are you not? And he said, yeah, yeah. you know, the hardest thing that we have right now is that society actually progresses because the old guard dies and then a new yeah. generation comes in with a new approach. And yeah. I don't know if we want a bunch of people living a long time <laughs> who have old ideas, they're going to end up suppressing everybody else. I thought that well, was an interesting uh, take on the whole situation. I, I, I take that personally, actually. I, I don't I don't want to be sent out to pasture. I got a lot of more to give still. So <laughs> I'm never going to call it, call it quits. <laughs> yeah, please. But I don't, get it. I get know. you know. It's interesting. You know, I don't think age is necessarily a factor. It's it's mindset and that mindset. Hundred percent. You know, and when I was at Cleveland Clinic, there were doctors in their seventies um, and older who were extremely open and curious and um, really connected to functional medicine. And then there were younger doctors who weren't. And and it you know, it's, but uh, there there was just an ossified mindset among certain people, and it's usually out of ignorance or fear. And people don't necessarily know or they're they're unfamiliar with it and so i don't know if age is really the determinant it's more well, i'm going on record i'm mindset. not an ageist <laughs> i have nothing against anybody at any age both younger or older this is really about having a youthful mind at any age youthful yeah. mind and yeah. a youthful mind is an open mind it's a mind that wants to learn it's a mind that's open to the idea that we're going to change our opinions sometimes. And that's actually how we yeah. get better. And if you look back at key moments in your life, those key moments of either really good things or really often challenging things, they kind of, if you leaned into the lesson, they opened your mind a little bit and you saw things in a different perspective. So, um, Absolutely. No, this reminds me of a Groucho Marx quote. He said, um, um, be open-minded, but not so open-minded that your brains fall out. <laughs> so I think having good, a good skeptical, critical mind is important, but also being open to exploring ideas that may be unfamiliar or may seem ludicrous, but actually turn out to be right. Uh, you know, and I, I, I'm, as I'm researching my book on longevity, I actually was sort of talking about this whole idea of the microbiome. 
and how the microbiome plays such a huge role in all disease and even aging. And, uh, and I was referencing the work of Eli Metchnikoff, who won the Nobel Prize in the early 1900s for the discovery of macrophages, which are a type of white blood cell. But he also had this theory that disease was caused by imbalances in the gut and that that was driving immune problems and inflammation and heart disease. And he was initially sort of, you know, respected because he was a Nobel Prize winner, but eventually was ridiculed for his work and people mm. pretty much thought he was crazy. And yet now, a hundred years later, they're like, oh yeah, the microbiome, it's connected to everything. You know? So it's, you know, it takes a hundred years, 120 years sometimes to figure shit out. A great reminder. And still, nonetheless, we have to track on and keep on moving and push in whatever way. If we're a drop in the ocean, let's be the best drop that we possibly can be. Uh, Mark, a couple other clarifying points on your answer back to Gary, which was really robust. You know, you talk about the ketogenic diet and a lot of people think immediately, you know, bacon, eggs, and a ton of red meat. But really what you're talking about with keto is much different. Can you just clarify with that and how yeah. you've adopted keto into being something that is not all the detrimental things that come from missing mm -hmm. key elements. Yeah, I mean, I, I think people misunderstand keto. For example, it's, it's not a high protein diet it, it, at all. Uh, it's actually moderate protein, high fat, low carbs. And and you know, what's fascinating is the uh, this book I read years ago called Undaunted Courage about the Lewis and Clark expedition. The food that they used to cross America and discover America in the early 1800s, it sent out way by Thomas Jefferson to see what was out there and go west, was pemmican which is a Native American food that's made up of mostly fat. It's rendered bison fat and a little bit of protein, bison meat, and berries. So it's basically like 70% fat, 20-something percent uh, protein, and the rest is uh, small amounts of berries and carbohydrate. And, and, and wait, one quick, pound quick, of that. Quick question, like, how are they eating that? Is it all blended together? Like, how do all no, those No, they make a bar. They make a bar. It's like a bar. It was the original bar. protein bar. It was the original, the original like, protein <laughs> bar. The original oh. protein bar. I, I think bar. I have your next business idea. You should re-release this protein. <laughs> well, actually, it's funny because I, I, I just was in Antarctica, uh, and I met this incredible man who's coming on the podcast, Colin O'Brady, who literally summited every mountain in the world at the, at the top peak in the, on every continent, I think in like 100 days. Days, and he literally skied across the South Pole, crossed Antarctica with pulling a sled behind him with all his gear. And he literally came up with these bars that were like the same kind of idea, very high fat, uh, these kind of similar pemmican bars. So, so those are ketogenic and, and it doesn't have to be unhealthy. So the typical view of ketogenic is it's like saturated fat and butter and cream and eggs and bacon, but no, it doesn't have to be that. It, it should be a very high plant rich diet with lots of good fats, avocados, olive oil, nuts and seeds, and some saturated fat actually can be good for some people. For some others, it may not. And, and, and we've talked about this in the podcast. People like me, who are thin and lean athletic, often have a paradoxical reaction with saturated fat where they actually get a worsening of their cholesterol. Whereas other patients who are very overweight and inflamed and diabetic, they do amazing. Like the people in the Verta Health studies where they were literally reverse 60% of the diabetics, type two advanced to type two diabetes, people on insulin, on lots of drugs, completely reversed it with a, a ketogenic diet. So it really, it depends on the person. And I think you can eat a, a very healthy ketogenic diet that's full of colorful plant foods, that's full of good fats, that has moderate protein, that's healthy protein, and and then you can do very well with it and, and it can be a very health promoting diet. The real question is, do you stay on it all the time? And I think, we haven't really come up with the answer yet. There's a whole concept of cyclical keto, which involves going on and off it. Yesterday, we we did grand rounds at Cleveland Clinic with Dr. Walter Longo, who's been on the podcast, who's studying the effects of a fasting mimicking diet, where he talks about these periodic cyclical stresses where you eat like you're starving. So that he does it with a very low calorie diet, 800 calories a day. But it also can be accomplished with ketogenic diets that you go on and off of. So we're still kind of learning about this. I just saw a New England Journal paper pop that I haven't even got to read it yet on time-restricted eating and weight loss. So we're still doing a lot of research, learning about this. Uh, but I do think that it's probably not good to be on all the time, but it can be very therapeutic and it can be used in certain cases. Cancer, for example, they're using ketogenic diets and curing stage four melanoma and pancreatic cancer, which are incurable diseases before now. And they're using it for brain tumors like glioblastoma, for Alzheimer's, for autism, for Parkinson's, for diabetes, for people with seizure disorders. In fact, that was the first 
medical use of a ketogenic diet when nothing else works. And this is, this is part of what I learned in medical school. It wasn't a, a kind of a new fad. The, the discovery was that these kids who were on a ketogenic diet, when no seizure medication would work, would stop their seizures by eating a ketogenic diet because the brain does much better on fat and it's not so irritable and inflamed. That's great. And I think one of the key themes, in addition to clarifying that, is really we're talking about a massive reduction in sugar, which is primarily coming from all these re refined carbohydrates. And I'm guessing that your patient that you were talking about before, a good chunk of her diet, in addition to all of the things that she was dealing with, the gut issues, et cetera, was probably heavily reliant on a lot of these processed carbohydrates. Yeah, I mean, she was eating a lot of rice and sugar and sweets. <laughs> it's like, you know, not exactly good for the brain. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, even... Um, I mean, I just got, and we're gonna have this person on the podcast. I'm very curious to hear what she has to say, but uh, there's a new book coming out in June, 2022 called The Great Plant-Based Con, which sort of kind of takes apart a lot of the sort of vegan ideology and and challenges a lot of the science. So I'm, I, I don't know what it says yet, but I'm very curious about it. And I kind of got a, a, a whiff of what it's about and I'm gonna have her look through it and we're gonna have an interesting conversation about it. But I, I just think we, we have to be really smart about our diet and personalize it. It has to be focused on quality. It has to be focused on food as medicine. It has to be personalized in a way to match the issues that you're struggling with or just for promotion of your health. So it, it's really, it, it, that's really why I wrote Food, What the Heck Should I Eat and The Pegan Diet, because I wanted to have uh, a place where people can go and find a coherent view of an inclusive way of eating that actually also promotes health. Okay, before we go into the next question, last final question off of what Gary was saying, he mentioned Robin Williams. Were you a Robin Williams fan? And- uh, Heck yes. Yeah, anything that <laughs> you want to mention Mindy. about- Mark and Mindy, yes. Actually, I, I, I met his son not too long ago. And I- Yeah, he's launched really, a new like supplement company, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he's actually uh, interesting. I think he works with, um, he works with another friend of mine. And it it was just, it was heartbreaking because I saw, I don't know if you all saw the movie, there was a documentary on it. And I, and it, it broke my heart because I, I feel like he didn't have to suffer. There was a way out. He just didn't know about it and nobody, around him knew about it. Uh, you know, and it, it's, it's just, it's just so, it's so just makes me angry, honestly, Drew. And I, you know, I talked to my daughter who's in medical school right now, and uh, she has a friend who's in medical school with her, and she's got all these inflammatory, weird autoimmune symptoms, and she's been to doctor after doctor, specialist after specialist, and she's still miserable, and nobody can give her answers, and they don't know what to look, they don't know what to do. And I'm like, well, this is not hard to solve. I mean, there are root causes of inflammation in the body that linked to autoimmune disease and all the symptoms she's having. And you just need to go through them. It's not that hard. It's toxins, allergens, microbes, infections like ticks, microbiome, diet, stress. I mean, it's a short list of things. And as a functional medicine doctor, my job is to be a detective and to find out what's at the root of the problem and not just cover over the symptoms. Yeah. And the last note that I'll mention about that, you know, Robin Williams, all the resources in the world, right? A well-off individual from well-deserved, a lifelong career of making people laugh and smile and cry and all those things. So he had yeah. resources financially and still yet even, and the patient that you mentioned, you know, luckily she got connected to you and the ultra wellness center, but so many people, even with resources struggle to get the right care. No. And if you're lucky enough to have resources and most people in the world are, are not, that's why it's even more important to go back to your original statement, which is about prevention. If we yeah. can think about these things, if we can integrate them and not wait till we get sick. We don't have to hope and wish that even if you have the education, you need a little bit of a nest egg to even sometimes pursue these things. It's, we're not going to lie. Mm -hmm. It's expensive sometimes, right? You were mentioning yeah, she had a yeah. cook, you know, functional medicine test, other things. So prevention, 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 practicing these things now so we don't end up in that position in the future. I mean, that's, that's the problem, Drew, is that, is that we don't get taught how our bodies work. We don't get taught how to create health. We don't get taught the practices and tools that are easily available to all of us that are inexpensive and accessible that we can use every single day to maintain our health. And, and you know, I've learned more and more as I've been doing this work for decades and I keep improving and I keep getting better and I keep fine tuning myself and, and I use myself as sort of a guinea pig, but it's really amazing to see, you know, now I'm 62 and I feel stronger, healthier, younger than I did at 42. And I, even pictures, when you look at me, pictures back then, I look younger and better now, which doesn't even make any sense because it was 20 years ago, but that's possible. 
I mean, I have a few more gray hairs, but you know, uh, that's from all the hard work. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Mark, we're going to tee up the next question. Mark, I'm a huge fan. Thanks for doing this. My question is, what is it about fried foods, even if you're just frying them at home, what, did it, what is it about them that makes them so harmful to the internals of a human? Eric, thanks for that question. Uh, you know, I like French fries like everybody else, <laughs> but there's a problem when you deep fry foods uh, and it has to do with multiple changes that happen to the fats, to the sugars and the proteins in the food you're cooking. So let's just sort of start let's say with French fries, because that's something that is probably the most common fried food that people eat. It's probably, I think it's, uh, there's like five top vegetables. It's potatoes are one of them and it's in the form of French fries. So literally it's, <laughs> it's one of the most ubiquitous foods we eat. And, and French fries are delicious, right? But they're crunchy, but they're made from starch. And there, there's also proteins in the, in the potatoes. And when you deep fry them, they form something called acrylamide. Acrylamide is a carcinogenic toxin that forms from the combination of uh, these sugars and proteins and fats fried at a high temperature. So it's really, really dangerous. And yet it's in all fried foods. The other thing that happens is, you know, we've changed the fat we use to use highly oxidized fat. So before, and, and, and there's a great Malcolm Gladwell podcast about this, about why McDonald's french fries used to taste better, is because they fried them in beef tallow. Tallow is beef fat, like lard, right? Except from a cow. And that's what they use to fry the McDonald's french fries. And when we, when we, you know, when we used to make pie crusts, we use lard. So we used solid animal fats for frying, which is, are much more stable, less oxidizable, and much safer to use for high temperature cooking. But now, what, then we switched, by the way, to uh, partially hydrogenated fats or trans fats, which was a disaster uh, for which killed literally hundreds of millions of people, 100,000 millions of people over the years, been ruled not as safe to eat by the FDA, although it's still everywhere. I mean, I went to the supermarket the other day and I saw Crisco and all the hydrogenated fat products. I'm like, what is it still doing here? In 2015, seven years ago, the government said we shouldn't be eating this. It's not safe. And yet they've given the food industry a long runway and a lot of loopholes to keep selling this stuff. So that was bad. And then they switched to now to refined vegetable oils or seed and bean oils, which are also extremely unstable. They're polyunsaturated fats. And under high temperature, they oxidize. Now, what is oxidation? Well, that's the process of fats going rancid or your apple turning brown that's left out in the air, your avocado turning brown or your skin wrinkling. That's oxidation. And when that happens, it creates a cascade of effects inside your body that creates inflammation, damages your tissues. And in fact, you know, your cholesterol is really not a problem unless there's oxidized cholesterol in your blood. So if you want to cause heart attacks and all the downstream effects of, of metabolic diseases, you know, eat fried food. <laughs> and what was really interesting was a study that came out that a single, a single fast food meal with fried foods had immediate effects on your arteries, causing them to stiffen and harden and reduce blood flow. Uh, so we really need to be smart about what we're eating. Do I ever eat a French fry? Yes, um, but I really don't make it a habit and it has to be a very special French fry. <laughs> and if you wanna you know, make French fries, you could bake them in the oven, you can have sweet potato fries and bake. There's a lot of ways to do it that, that are less harmful, but I, I think uh, it's important. Another thing is air fryers. I've never really used one of those. I mean, I don't know how it's work, but it seems like a good idea. I don't know if you still get the problem because what happens is you also get these, um, these uh, ad, we call ages, advanced glycation ed products, which are just, just damaged proteins. It's like creme brulee, the crispy thing on top or the crust of a bread or a crispy skin. It's proteins and sugars interacting to form these products called ages or in advanced glycation end products. And, and they bind to these receptors on your cell called rages. So we're raging or aging. <laughs> Literally, I think it was a smart acronym. And, and that creates inflammation through the body, aging and, and basically cellular destruction. So it's really important to limit your intake of these foods as much as possible. And, and I like crispy this and that like the next person, but I really, I really try not to eat it. <laughs> yeah, that's great, Mark. I'll add in a couple things to that. 
I, I have used an air fryer and I know for a lot of people who do enjoy fried foods, immediate easy step is switch to an air fryer. You know, don't be deep frying and other things. Even sometimes people would go out and a lot of people who say, well, I'll only have like fries on the weekend or fried food on the weekend say, well, get an air fryer at home because that's going to be better at least. But I haven't seen the deep studies or I don't know if anybody's done it to know, like you said, is it that much better? But I can tell you that fried food is my kryptonite. And I feel like I have like a stealth virus, you know, I've talked about it with a few uh, functional medicine doctors, maybe even in like, you know, you can have stealth viruses in like your tonsils and other stuff that yeah, yeah, yeah. under a lot of stress, uh, and it takes a lot of stress, but when I eat fried food, immediately my entire throat swells up. I have my nodules, my tonsils, everything kind of swells up a little bit. Yeah. So Creates I pretty much stay away. What's that? It creates inflammation. Creates inflammation. That's so basically what me, I was saying. It creates inflammation. <laughs> yeah. So for me, I'm like the canary in the coal mine. I can see it immediately uh, show up. But when I have it with the air fryer, which again is much more of a treat, uh, not a regular thing in my diet, it doesn't happen to that same uh, degree. So great, uh, great answer on that. All right, Mark. So I'm going to tee up our next question from Janine from Delaware, my home state. Hi, Dr. Mark. My name is Janine Fusco Lano from Delaware. Thanks for all you do. Do you recommend a company like Viome or Everly Well to find out what your triggers are in terms of inflammation and possibly weight gain? Thank you so much. Well, Janine, thanks for your question. And I think uh, the the head of that question is really, should we be excited about self-testing? Should we be able to actually democratize testing and allow people to find out what's going on inside their bodies, whether it's through food allergy testing or stool testing or blood testing or saliva testing. And I, and I strongly believe that people should be empowered with their own health data, that people are smart enough, capable enough, and with the right guidance and information, they can actually take this information and make meaningful changes to their life and health from it. And I, and I really believe this strongly. And I've been trying to get people to own their data for a long time. And I've been doing diagnostic testing. And I remember when I was in medical school, the doctor like never, never gave the results of the test to the patient. They said, oh, your lab tests are fine. Your cholesterol is fine. Your blood chemistry is fine. Your blood count is fine. I'm like, okay, but like, don't you think the patients should be able to have a recovery of their own report? So I really strongly believe that we should be empowered with our own health data. We should be able to actually self-test and self-diagnose whenever possible. However, there are a lot of companies out there producing all sorts of diagnostic tests that are getting a little ahead of themselves, I think. So there's there's food testing around genetics and nutrigenomics, there's food sensitivity or allergy testing, there's stool test companies out there, and they're all different. What I would say is, you know, as someone who's spent you know, the majority of my life looking deeply into diagnostics and testing to find out what's going on with people, they're all over the place. So, you know, I, I, I give you an example. I have, um, you know, I, we do split sampling on testing, but I have I have a lot of quantified self devices just to try them out. So I have an aura ring, I have an Apple Watch, I have an eight sleep bed, I have, uh, you know, different sleep apps, a sleep watch. I have all this stuff, and and it's just amusing to me because I'll run them all at the same time on the same night and the same thing. I mean, I'll come up with like really different results, <laughs> and I'm like, they're not so far off, but they're like, wow, this is interesting. You said I got nine hours. You said I got seven hours. You said my sleep was 80%. This one I said my sleep was 90%. I'm like, and, and so we, we're really still in an era of fine tuning the diagnostics. And I would say these, these diagnostic tests should be used with caution. You shouldn't overinterpret them. Certainly if you want to do a sort of a food allergy or sensitivity test and you find something you want to try to eliminate your diet for a little while, fine. Uh, some of the tools to, stool testing companies go a little far. Um, they look at the microbiome itself, which is, you know, what are the bugs in there? And that's helpful, but you know, you've got up to a thousand different bugs. They do all kinds of different things. It changes literally with every meal. So if you take your poop on Monday or take it on Wednesday, it's gonna be different. Even, even we've done this, even within the same stool sample, you can sample different parts of the stool, which may represent different meals that you've had, and they're all different. So you can send literally the same poop from the same person on the same day to the lab, the same lab, and get three different results. So you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt and understand the context of the test and not over interpret the test. I literally just went over somebody's test result 
which told them to stop eating a lot of really healthy foods, which I, I just don't agree with. I think we, we're really not there in connecting the dots between, oh, you've got this particular bacterial profile in your gut, you shouldn't eat these 12 foods that actually are pretty healthy, like avocados or almonds or whatever. Like I can understand saying, well, don't eat you know, processed food and don't eat sugar and you know, you know that's fine. But I think it's a little bit of an overreach. I think we'll get there, we're learning. And it's not to say that that we, we actually should ignore those results. It's just that we have to understand them in the context of our overall life and preferences and diet and health. So um, that, that's kind of how I see them. They're, they're, they're guideposts, but they're not, this is, you know, this is the gospel. And I always feel, Mark, a good functional medicine doctor, and there's, there's a lot of them that are, that are out there, and a lot of them that also do like remote uh, work with patients these days, they'll help you understand that the best case scenario from some of these tests, especially stool tests, is you're looking for not so much the individual food that works for you or doesn't. That's very hard to do unless if you have a specific allergy that's there, but most people are dealing with sensitivities and other stuff. They're going to more help you see, is there a lot of leaky gut, for example? Yes, They're looking at yes. the trends and the themes. And if a lot of foods flag, especially in a particular category, as being uh, you know, triggering an, uh, some sort of antibody response uh, or immune response, then that might be an indication that, okay, there's leaky gut. We need to dig in a little bit deeper. We need to go in that area. So they're taking these yeah. themes and trends, not so much the individual foods, as you mentioned, yeah. it doesn't really feel like we're there. Yeah. I mean, I, I would, I would, I would agree. And I would add to that, that you know, the question is not what foods are you sensitive to or allergic to is why are you so sensitive and fix that. The goal isn't to create more restriction, but to create more resilience for people so they can tolerate a wide, more wider variety of foods without having the problem of making them sick. So I, I think that often gets missed. And I think these, these tests are overinterpreted and say, oh, I'm allergic to these things. No, you're not allergic. You're sensitive. And two, if you don't deal with the reason you're sensitive, you're not necessarily going to fix the problem just by eliminating the foods. So it's, it's much more complex than that. And I think the testing kind of gives people a false sense of what's right or wrong and what to do and not do but it's, it's a much more deeper conversation about how do we heal our microbiome? How do we heal our gut? How do we prevent leaky gut? How do we actually reduce food sensitivities, not increase restrictions on our diet? All right, Mark, our next question is from Melissa, who has a question about leaky gut, which we just talked about. Hi, Dr. Hyman. So I was recently diagnosed with subclinical hypothyroidism and leaky gut. I was wondering if there are some ways in which I can heal my leaky gut other than just taking the right probiotics and removing food sensitivities from my diet. Thanks. Mm, well, thank you, Melissa, for your question about low thyroid function, what we call subclinical hypothyroidism, but I don't even think that's the right word, and how it connects to food sensitivities and leaky gut. So subclinical means you don't have symptoms, but there's something wrong. The truth is most people with low-grade thyroid problems do have symptoms, but they're just subtle. So low thyroid symptoms can be fatigue, depression, insomnia, constipation, muscle cramps, muscle twitching, you know, menstrual difficulties, high cholesterol, you know, all kinds of things that are just, we think are quote normal, but they're not. So I, I do think it's pe important for people to get it properly treated. The question is, what's the cause? Th low thyroid function is a symptom. What's the cause? And it could be many things, right? It can be heavy metals. It can be environmental toxins, which are really common as triggers for autoimmune thyroid disease. But it also, it also can be what's going on in your microbiome. And the truth is that the microbiome and leaky gut are really important in discovering uh, what often the root causes are for autoimmunity. So if you have autoimmune thyroid disease, which is maybe the case, and, and by the way, I, I wrote a whole sort of ebook called The Ultra Thyroid Solution, which details exactly what you should do in terms of what diagnostic tests you should have, what the diet you should be on, what nutrients are important, what vitamins you should take, what thyroid you should take, how to properly look at things. And if the doctor, for example, isn't looking at your thyroid antibodies and looking at all the thyroid tests, including TSH, free T3, and free T4, they're not actually getting a full picture. And you may actually have sort of borderline um, elevated TSH, which means low thyroid, but if you have elevated antibodies, it means you have an autoimmune disease. And that's really important to know because Hashimoto's or the autoimmune disease that causes low thyroid function is often caused by gluten. It can be caused by other things, by environmental toxins, but also caused by gluten. Now, how does that work? Well, gluten increases something called zonulin in the gut. And Alessio Fasano, who we've had on the podcast, who's one of the world's experts on celiac and gluten is at Harvard. He first studied this, this 
phenomena uh, in cholera and discovered that in cholera, the body produces something called zonulin, which is this protein that causes the cells in the gut lining to come apart and creates leaky gut, which is where you get diarrhea and you can't, it just it creates a mess. And people, that's why people die from cholera. But he also found that gluten causes the same thing, not to the same degree, but it causes increases in zonulin, which drive the gut to become leaky. When the gut's leaky, basically you're allowing food proteins and food particles and bacterial toxins to leak across the lining of the gut, not go through the cells, but between the cells and go right into the immune system because 60% of the immune system is right there. And so I would say a fair bit of my patients with Hashimoto's or a little thyroid have elevated gluten antibodies. Now they might have full-blown celiac or they might, but even if you don't have full-blown celiac and you have antibodies, it means there's something wrong. It means one, you're exposed to gluten, two, you have a leaky gut, and three, that your immune system got pissed off and created antibodies, like due to COVID, right? So if you have any antibodies, there's a problem. Now the question is, is it clinical? Are you having symptoms? Should you worry about it? Depends on your symptoms and overall degree of health. But for many people, it can be a big factor. So the key is one, find out what the triggers are. Is it gluten? Is it something else? Two, rebuild your gut. Now that involves one, a program that I, I jokingly call the weeding, seeding, and feeding program. And in functional medicine, we call it 5R, but that's a little more complicated. But essentially the idea is weed out all the bad stuff. Get all the foods that are triggering you, all the bad bugs out, small bacterial overgrowth, fungal overgrowth, parasites, whatever you got. And then seed the gut with healthy bacteria, probiotics, and so forth, and feed it with prebiotics and healing nutrients and polyphenols, things like zinc and omega-3 fats and vitamin A and vitamin D and all kinds of things that are important, glutamine, to help repair the gut lining. So when we do that weeding and seeding and feeding program, it literally can repair the leaky gut and become much, you can be much more resilient. When I was really sick with chronic fatigue syndrome oh, 20 plus years ago, I couldn't eat anything. I literally would eat anything. My stomach would blow up like a balloon. I would feel sick. I'd get dark circles under my eyes. I'd get rashes on my tongue, sores all over my body. And I was just so reactive to the foods I was eating. And I had to eat like turkey, broccoli, and brown rice for like a year because <laughs> I couldn't eat anything. And, and then I learned how to fix my gut. And I actually had to fix the mercury that was causing the leaky gut. Because like I said, there's a lot of things that can cause it. For me, it wasn't gluten. It was mercury. And, and until you figure out what the issue is, you can't fix it. And whether, for example, you might have hypothyroidism, but, and you might have leaky gut, but the cause might not be food sensitivities. It might be the result. Food sensitivities occur as a result of leaky gut. They can also, gluten can cause a leaky gut. So it's, it's a little complicated, but, but so can other things like mercury for me was causing a leaky gut that made me sensitive to all the foods. So you have to kind of go back and think about how do you repair the gut? And, and we've had many podcasts about how to heal your gut, whether it's inflammatory bowel disease, whether it's irritable bowel, whether it's reflux. These are really common problems. In fact, the most common problems people go to the doctor with are gut problems. So the good news is we know how to do this now. Unfortunately, you, I, you know, I, I just saw a patient yesterday, Drew, and it was very disturbing to me. He was a young 18-year-old man who suffered gut issues his whole life, was on lots of antibiotics, born by C-section, and uh, was just always bloated, distended, constipated. And, and he was treated for bacterial overgrowth, which was the right thing to do because he had SIBO. But they just gave him antibiotics for two weeks and they said, okay, see you later. And they didn't do any of the gut rebuilding protocol, which is really important because I see many people, even with full-blown celiac, that don't get fully better unless you repair their gut lining and repair the leaky gut, which isn't going to happen necessarily from just getting rid of gluten. You have to fix the whole microbiome. You know, I want to give a shout out to one person on our network, Isabella Wentz, thyroid pharmacist, has a lot of free thyroid resources. Uh, you have your thyroid Absolutely. ebook, which is great. It hasn't been updated in a little bit of while. So like, you know, getting some of the latest information. But it's, still, it's there. still pretty, it's still pretty the current. Foundations think, are there. The foundations yeah, are there. Yeah, for the sure. Foundations are there. Mark, any program, you know, this is one of the challenges is that do you feel that gut protocols, when it comes to that weeding, seeding, and feeding, do you feel like there are any standard protocols that are available or books that go deep into it and kind of guide you through that process? Or is it so specific that really people need to work or think about working with a practitioner if they can? I, that's a great question, Drew. I mean, I think the basics people can do. And I think, you know, we created an ebook called The uh, Irritable Bowel Solution, which is really about using diet and a number of supplements to help with resetting your gut. And that works for a lot of people. And I can't tell you how many people who I've seen who 
who I've never seen, I mean, who I've met, who I've never seen, who said, I followed the program, I did a 10-day detox, I did what you said, and I got better. And so a lot of people can get better without seeing a doctor. The problem is if you have something that needs to be treated, right? If you have heavy metals like I did, or if you have a parasite that needs to be treated, or you have really bad SIBO or CIFO, you need medication, you kind of need to work with a doctor. But for many people, you can use diet and herbs and lifestyle and have a huge impact on your gut health. All right, Mark, our last question for today, who's asking about H. pylori? Hi, I test positive for H. pylori. I've tried to clear it twice with antimicrobials uh, under the supervision of my doctor, uh, but it's not working. I still test positive. Is there another way? H. pylori is a bacteria. It's really common that causes ulcers, but it can also cause, we call it dyspepsia or indigestion, heartburn, reflux. And uh, this, I'll tell you a little bit about the backstory on it because it's kind of fascinating. Is uh, This bacteria was seen for years by gastroenterologists on biopsies, and they thought I was just this kind of innocent bystander, and it wasn't really causing any of the GI symptoms that they were treating. And we used to think ulcers were stress and emotional issues. We used to cut the vagus nerve. I literally would cut the nerves to the stomach as part of the treatment and surgery to get rid of ulcers. And it was terrible. And we'd give people acid blockers and all kinds of stuff. And people would have to have surgery and bleeding. It was, it was, it was quite a scary disease. Uh, then we discovered these drugs called PPIs or acid blockers and things like Tagamet and Pepsid and Zantac, which really helped. But it, there was a, a scientist, not even a scientist actually, a doctor, a, a gastroenterologist named Barry Marshall from Australia, who had this crazy idea that this bacteria wasn't just a bystander, but it was actually the cause of ulcers called Helicobacter pylori. And he's like, look, I think this is the cause. And all of his colleagues made fun of him. They laughed at him. So he did an experiment, which seems really crazy, but it really worked. So he got, he got a beaker full of this bacteria. He drank it. First, before he had one of his friends who's a GI doctor scope him. So they did a whole exam. They took pictures. They looked at his stomach. And then he drank this stuff. Then he waited a while, and then he got ulcers. And then by, he by the way, can I just interject one second? I feel like <laughs> doctors back in the day were so gangster. They would do experiments like that. They would this was not like... that long ago. This was not even that long ago, Drew. This was like not even that long ago. This is like you know, this is since I graduated from medical school. So it's not that long wow. ago. Although wow. that was a long time ago. <laughs> and and it wasn't like this was in 1905. This was like in I think the 80s <laughs> and our 90s. And then he and he and he basically drank the beaker, got the ulcer, got scoped again, and then he said, "Well, I'm going to give myself antibiotics." I'm going to cure it and then my ulcer is going to go away. And, and he basically did that. He basically gave himself ulcers through this drinking the bacteria and then he cured it with antibiotics. And this really fulfills the criteria for a causation using this concept of Cox postulates, which is a scientific term for basically uh, this guy, the scientist Cox, Cox, who basically discovered how we prove that a bacteria caused an illness. So anyway, that was fascinating. And he ended up winning the Nobel Prize for this discovery. So since that time, now it's kind of standard of care. And we can test for H. pylori through multiple ways. We can test through uh, a stomach biopsy, which they actually do when they do a scopes. When they do an endoscopy, they put a scope down your throat and they stick in your stomach and they can take a biopsy and they can send it to the lab and they can see it. Or you can do a breath test where you drink this liquid that the bacteria ferment and you can actually do a breath test, which is probably the most accurate to see if you have an active infection. Or you can do a stool antigen test where you're looking for the, like, like we now have antigen tests for COVID, it looks for the protein on the, on the bacteria and can actually measure it. And that's a stool test. And lastly, there's antibody testing, which tells you that your body's creating antibodies against it like antibodies to COVID. The problem with the antibody testing, it doesn't tell if you had an infection or you have an infection. So it, it, you know, it, your, your cells, immune cells have memory. That's why when you get the measles vaccine or when you get the COVID vaccine, your body remembers you had an exposure to that bacteria or that virus, and it prevents an, the, 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 the infection by creating antibodies against it. So the, at least the that's antibodies how it should be, that's At least that's how it should work. <laughs> yeah, right. That's how it should work, right. But the antibodies don't tell you if you have an active infection. So you have to know what you're doing. Now, you're asking, you've treated this with antibiotics, you've been tested. I don't know what tests you had. I don't know actually what happened. But but what happens is often it's also contagious. <laughs> so if your partner or your spouse or your lover, you know, has it and they may be asymptomatic, 
And if you're in bed with them, you're going to get it again. So it may not be that you didn't cure it. It may be that you got reinfected with it. So you have to kind of figure out who's in your intimate circle and get them tested too. And they have to be treated too, or else you're going to get it to recur. Now, there are cases where it's recurrent. And it may be because the, the treatment protocols are not effective. And there's many different protocols, but it usually involves an antibiotic or two and, and an acid blocker. So uh, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's kind of an important protocol to follow for two weeks, but it, 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 it may not work. Uh, just like antibiotics don't work for all infections and it may be resistant or maybe a strain of each player that doesn't respond to this particular cocktail. So you might have to try two or three different cocktails of drugs to actually work. But I would encourage you to make sure you're not in the bed or making out with somebody who might have it and get tested first. Mark, you know, I have a couple friends, dear friends of mine who have struggled with H. pylori, pylori over years. And first, I want to even add that a lot of functional medicine doctors will tell people that I think the estimates are, you know, 40 to 60 percent of the population has H. pylori. Is that about accurate? It's common. Yes. And it's not common. everybody's symptomatic. Right. Not everybody's yes. symptomatic. So there are people that are symptomatic and there's people that are not. Now, the friends of mine over the years that have tried a lot of these standard protocols, antibiotics, um, and the H. pylori ends up coming back, in that process, they also end up destroying their gut, and they end up with a lot of other symptoms on top of the H. pylori symptoms. That's a thing, right. And that's a sort of a vicious cycle that I'd yeah. love to get your yeah. take on, yeah. because yeah. it's like, okay, do I go back to the doctor and destroy my gut again, or... Mm. Do I build up my resilience enough, change my diet, change my gut microbiome, so at least I can manage H. pylori a little yeah. bit better? Yeah, I mean, I would say yes, and also that there are herbal formulas and regimens that work that I've used. So people don't want to take antibiotics, or I'll try it first. So mastic gum and, and certain kinds of zinc and certain kinds of herbs and licorice, and there's cocktails of stuff that actually have been effective in my clinical experience. It not, doesn't mean everybody will respond to them, but it's often worth trying the herbal forms of treatment first and seeing if that works. And yeah, because that's a whole rabbit hole. We'll link to a couple articles. I'll go look up some that some of your peers or maybe even you have written and we'll put them in the show notes to have additional resources for people who want to continue to dive further. Mark, those are our questions that we have here for today. So I'm going to pass it over to you to go ahead and close us out. Oh, uh, dear, thank you so much. And everybody, thank you for your questions. I really love hearing from you. I love hearing the questions. I think there are answers that often are not available easily to people who are struggling with really chronic problems, whether it's Lewy body or low thyroid function or H. pylori or whatever you're struggling with. And I think that's the beauty of functional medicine, that it's really a map for how we navigate this territory of chronic illness that up to now we really haven't had a good map for. And, and that's really the purpose of the whole field of functional medicine is to help people deal with these chronic issues. So I'm just really glad you've offered your questions and I'd like to hear more of them and I love answering them. So this is awesome. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. We need to really look at the facts about what's happening with our food supply, with our nutrient levels, both in our food and in our bodies and the consequence of that for our health. So I always say, you know, I don't think anybody needs supplements, but only under certain conditions. One, you have to hunt and gather your own